dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure today to welcome Leticia Sneeman, the chair of the University of the Third Age, the U3A here in Hermanus. Leticia is from Zimbabwe, or Odisha as it was originally, and has been a teacher for many years, both in England and in South Africa. She was the principal of the Rhenish Girls High School in Stellenbosch before retiring to Hermanus. Leticia has prepared various lectures on literary figures for us. Today, Ante is no exception. We thank you, Leticia, for the preparation, as well as the ladies who have worked with you, Christine Cleo and Trudy Kuhlman. We're certainly looking forward to it. We are celebrating the commemoration of Dante's anniversary this year. He was born in 1265 and died in 1321. Dante was born in Florence, but he died in exile in Ravenna in 1321. Why? We have much to tell you. His life and career were closely bound up with the politics of Florence and Italy in particular. Europe in the Middle Ages was dominated by conflict between two groups the Holy Roman Empire and the Papal States. The Holy Roman Empire had its origins in the coronation of Charlemagne in the year 800 and was only disbanded by Napoleon in 1806. This is a map of the empire at its height. This map shows you where the modern states are. Note the position of the Vatican states and, interestingly, the powerful independent Venetian states. More about this later. We now need to look at how this wider conflict manifested itself in Italy in particular. Florentine political life was characterized by the conflict between the pro-imperial Ghibellines and the pro-papist Gulfs, and that impacted seriously on Dante's life. He was born in 1265 to a family committed to the Gulf faction. On the 12th, 11th of June 1289, he was involved in the Battle of Compaldino, which brought a strategic victory to the Gulfs. Their ascent to power brought important changes to the constitution. For instance, citizens were now required to join a guild in order to participate in civic affairs. Dante joined the Physicians and Apothecaries Guild. Soon after this, the Gulf split into the white, Dante, and black, Dunati factions. Dante's white faction sought more independence from Rome in 1300. Christine will be telling you more about these events later, as well as the development of his political theories during this period. In 1300, Dante was a member of the delegation to Rome to discuss changes to the papal authority. For some reason, he was kept there by the Pope when the other delegates returned to Florence. So, when the Blacks gained power in 1302, Dante was still in Rome and his political rivals used this fact as an excuse to exile him. In exile, he refined his political theories, which were eventually published in De Monarchia, which Christine will discuss later. He championed the cause of the Ro Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI of Luxembourg in his conflict with the Pope and Florence. He called him the new Charlemagne and proposed a universal monarchy under his kingship in place of the papal authority. There were several attempts to rescind Dante's exile, but when this work was published, he was permanently exiled 
and his extradition for execution demanded. But Ravenna refused fudge, and he died there on the 14th of September 1321. But that is not the end of the story, as I will explain later. He was a poet, a philosopher, and political commentator. He was very influential, both locally and internationally. He traveled widely and communicated with other scholars and writers. He was the father of the Italian language. While Latin was the language used by all European writers at the time, he began to use his local Tuscan dialect, out of which the official standardized Italian language developed. He was, indeed is, revered as Il Somo Poeta, the supreme poet. He enjoyed a huge reputation, even in his own lifetime, as these early portrayals show. Giotto was a contemporary, uh, and you can see how revered already Dante was. Note in particular the Giotto painting. Giotto was a contemporary, and this shows the regard in which he was held. He was prolific. There, he wrote a lot, but we are going to look at just three works. La Vita Nuova, The New Life. This is a collection of lyric poems with prose commentary, a celebration of his love for Beatrice. De Monarchia, a Latin treatise on secular and religious power. And then The Biggie, his most important work, the Divine Comedy. La Vita Nuova, The New Life, is the story of his love for one woman, Beatrice Portinari. Who was she? She was a member of a prominent banking family, and they met when they were nine. He fell in love with her, and he wrote about her throughout his life. He was betrothed to Gemma Donati when he was 12. This type of betrothal was quite customary at the time, and they married in 1285. Uh, Beatrice also married someone else. Gemma and Dante had three sons and one daughter, but he never wrote about her. Beatrice died in 1290. He was devastated by the news and vowed to honour her in his work. She is commemorated in La Vita Nuova and plays an important part in the Divine Comedy, but more about that later. This work, La Vita Nuova, deals with Dante's interaction with Beatrice. It is a selection of love poems set within an prose framework that places them both chronologically and autobiographically. It gives us the history of his love for Beatrice. It is typical of the tradition of so-called courtly love, which was celebrated in the French and Pro Provençal poetry of the early Middle Ages. Although the practice of courtly love was well known and celebrated, Dante gave expression to it in a unique style which he called Dolce Stil Nova, the new sweet style. His love for Beatrice would become his reason for poetry and for living. She is idealized in his work, not only in La Vita Nuova, but most notably, she is his guide in paradise in the Divine Comedy, as we will discuss later. medieval painting of courtly love in medieval Europe, uh, a conception of love that emphasized nobility and chivalry. The Provencal poets in the 11th century 
uh, were very much part of this tradition and the music and stories were spread by the French troubadours. Always love seen as an allegorical ideal. Here's a, a very famous painting, Henry Holliday's painting. Dante was very popular with the Pre-Raphaelites. In this painting, Beatrice in white seems to be snubbing Dante. He mentions this meeting in his work and says it spurred him to write La Vita Nova. And here are the opening stanzas of the work. Trudy will read the Italian. The English translation is on the right. Beatrice is called Beecher, a nickname, and is introduced as the embodiment of the spirit of love which he is invited to explore. Io mi senti svegliar dentro allo core un spirito amoroso che dormia, e poi vidi venir da lunghi amore allegro sì che appena il conoscia dicendo or pensa pur di farmi onore in ciascuna parola sua ridia e poco stando meco il mio signore guardando in quella parte onde venia io vidi monna vanna e mona bice venire in vorle loco lo vio era l'una appresso dell'altra mi riviglia E siccome la mente mi ridice, amor mi disse, quella è primavera e quella non è amor, si mi somiglia. That is lovely, thank you Trudy. Beatrice also appears in another work, Convivio, in which we have an analysis of love in political terms. Philosophy is discussed as the love of wisdom and Dante's central metaphor for representing it is the poetic celebration of a noble lady, a donna gentile, Beatrice, who receives divine virtue just as angels do. God, by instilling his radiance in her love of philosophy, assimilates her form to his likeness. More about this in the Divine Comedy. In Convivio, we have Dante's emerging political philosophy. Poetic discourse is used as a tool in a project to unify people under the joint rule of philosophy and empire. This is developed in De Monarchia. In De Monarchia, foreshadowed in the discussion of empire in Convivio, his purpose is to demonstrate the necessity of a single ruling power respectful of and reverent to the church, but independent of it, capable of ordering the will of collective humanity in peace and concord. Here is the Italy of Dante's time. Gone is the Roman Empire, and in its place is a patchwork of states. Check the band of states belonging to the papacy some held until the 19th century. The Pope also had an army, not of angels, which he used to keep and increase his land and property in Italy. One reason why Dante wanted changes. And the Roman Empire has gone, replaced by the Holy Roman Empire. The emperor of originally voted in by various kings and princes. Volte was probably joking when he said it was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. It was finally dissolved by Napoleon in 1806. When Dante wrote De Bonarchia, he was targeting not only the shortcomings of medieval monarchs and squabbles among Italian states, but also the papacy and anyone else who annoyed him. There was also the Guelph and Ghibelline problem, which descended into actual warfare in Florence. 
Guelphs won and split into two factions, blacks and whites. When the blacks won, Dante could have stayed, but he refused to and did not pay the fine, which was quite moderate. He then left Florence forever. The Pope eventually put his foot down, banning the mention of blacks and whites. Dante also had a few problems with hypocrites and would-be theologists. He hated the greedy who gobbled up wealth and land and gave nothing back. And the maker made up. It was asserted that the gifts given by the Magi to Christ symbolize the two powers, and therefore the Vicar of Christ has powers over the spiritual and temporal things at the same time, stretching things. Of Pope Boniface VIII. We declare, say, define and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. The Pope, the Pope at the time was Boniface VIII, whose vaulting ambition led him to declare the superiority of the papacy over mere mortal rulers. He also grabbed the land of a rival family, the Colonnas, sharing it out amongst his own family. The Colonnas captured the Pope, famously slapping his face to show their contempt of him and freed him from imprisonment when he had become too feeble to react. Church and state, the power struggle. As if he didn't have enough on his plate, Boniface now had to face Philip IV of France, who was taxing the church to finance his wars with the English. The Pope had Dante exiled from, for supporting the idea that the papal power had limitations. He was never to live in his beloved Florence again. We shall see what Dante did to the Pope. Dante believed that the Pope had a purely spiritual authority and that the Empire should not interfere with spiritual situations. He based his view of Empire on the Roman Empire and the first Emperor Augustus, whom he said had brought peace to the ancient world. Dante believed that the foundation of the Christ of the Church is Christ, who said his kingdom was not of this world. That of the empire is human rights and earthly happiness. So man has two guides, the Pope for spiritual matters, theology, and the emperor or king for earthly problems, philosophy. So on purely spiritual matters, the emperor gave way to the Pope. The Pope was not happy, but the idea took hold and produced the humanists. And the Pope is not there to produce miracles. The Church <clears throat> must preach the life of Christ. Caesar should address Peter with that respect that a first-born son owes his father, so that radiated by the light of his father, he himself can illuminate the world more effectively. Dante's influence didn't end there. Along with other great thinkers and doers, it led to the Renaissance and on to the Enlightenment of the 18th century. Thank you, Christine. Now to his greatest work, The Divine Comedy. By the way, Dante called it Comedia. It is Boccaccio that used the word divine, and that has remained the title ever since. 
Now, comedia is a strange word because it doesn't mean something that is funny. It means works that have a positive ending. The Divine Comedy is in three parts, Canzoni, the Inferno, the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. Each part has 33 cantos, episodes. Now, you must remember throughout this talk, and when you look at Dante and medieval literature, and throughout um, Christian literature, that there are sacred numbers beyond Christianity, even in the ancient world, but the sacred numbers are three, seven, and ten. Now, each part of the comedy has got 33 cantos, plus one introductory canto. That gives you a total of a perfect 100. Each line has precisely 11 syllables. And this is an example of what I call symmetrical poetic architecture. And he invented the Tarzarima, which is a three-line stanza using chain rhyme, ABA, BCB, CDC, etc. I think you'll find some of the Romantic poets found this uh, a delightful uh, literary style to, to copy. So you've got the Tarzarima. In the Divine Comedy, the narrator Dante undertakes a journey which leads him to visit the souls in hell, purgatory and paradise. You can think of what happens in Homer and Virgil as well. The characters he meets are real historical people. The story is set in 1300 at Easter time. There is biographical detail in the text. And he has two guides, the Roman poet Virgil and Beatrice. The whole narration is about the exile of an individual, which then becomes a symbol of the problems of a country and the degradation of mankind. The inferno hell is in the shape of an inverted cone-shaped hole in the earth with Satan at the centre. And it is made up of nine circles, plus a vestibule, that gives you the ten, the perfect number. And in this hell you find sinners of all kinds, including several popes, priests, traitors, murderers, including Cain, the first murderer, the assassins of Julius Caesar, Judas Iscariot, etc. And amongst the sinners are his enemies. It really is a ruthless attack on his political rivals. And it has a terrifying array of punishments. What you must remember is that it is written from a medieval worldview, which is a, a Christian one. And I'm going to read to you how the, the uh, Inferno starts with a couple of passages from Canto 1. Midway upon the journey of our life. So we think he was 35. Remember, 70 is the expected uh, biblical number. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Ah me, how hard a thing it is to say what was this forest savage, rough and stern, which in the very thought renews the fear. So bitter is it, death is little more, but of the good to treat which there I found, speak will I of the other things I saw there. And he meets the shade of Virgil, the Roman poet, who says this when he's addressed, not man, man once I was, and both my parents were of Lombardy. Sub Julia was I born, though it was late, and lived at Rome under the good Augustus during the time of false and lying gods. A poet was I, and I sang that just son of Anchises who came forth from Troy after that Ilion the superb was burned. And Virgil offers to be his guide through hell and purgatory. 
I think and judge it for the best. Thou follow me and I will be thy guide and lead thee hence through the eternal place where thou shalt hear the desperate lamentations, shalt see the ancient spirits disconsolate who cry out each one for the second death. And here's this delightful painting by William Blake where Virgil and Dante are at the entrance to hell, Virgil inviting Dante to enter. I need to remind you of the mythology of the battle between Satan and his fellow rebel angels against the army of God under the command of Michael. After his defeat, Satan was hurled out of heaven and fell onto the earth. In Dante's hell, Inferno, the impact results in a huge inverted cone-shaped hole in the earth with Satan at the centre. There are nine circles plus the vestibule, the ten perfect number. In the Inferno, we find, as I've told you, all these sinners that are undergoing the most dreadful nightmarish punishments, a terrifying attack of punishments. In this Inferno painting by Botticelli, you can see the inverted cone in which on each circle there are sinners being punished. I'm going to show you the trailer from a modern horror movie based on the Inferno called Abandon All Hope that demonstrates this nightmare character of Dante's hell very vividly. You are about to experience a journey to the worst of the afterlife for the first time. A powerful, electrifying first glimpse of what hell is really like. Strange mythological beasts, tortured like no human can stand in the flesh. And finally, meet face to face with Lucifer, the devil himself, the king of hell. Limbo, lust, gluttony, avarice, wrath, heresy, violence, fraud, treason. Modo in cui si rappresentasse tutto l'inferno nel suo insieme. First circle, limbo. Non è nell'inferno, non è nel purgatorio, non è nel paradiso, ma è sospeso. Second circle, the lustful. I found this piece to be very, very emotional and actually because Dante not only is a poet, but he also expresses his emotions very well when he's told the story by Francesco. Third circle, the gluttons. He torments the gluttons, he constantly picks them up, lashes them around, throws them back down to the ground. He howls louder than any He can't be satiated at all because of his gluttonous nature. Here reside the avaricious. Dante pictures popes and cardinals and priests living in that place of eternal torment. Fifth circle, the wrathful. The journey of the poets across the river of Styx, which is the river of condemned souls. There's this incredible fire, and these three furies appear, and they are Medusa's servants. And the furies have got these, you know, they're clawing, they've got, they're covered in blood. Dante and Virgil cannot go any farther, and at that moment when they lose complete hope, the angel recognizes that this is their time, the angel manifests himself, and he says, I bid thee go. And the power and the angelic presence of God opens that door, and the demons shake, and they fall down side, and Dante and Virgil are allowed to proceed. Sixth circle. Here is I, the heretics. Sees them. It's not that he puts them there. It's almost he observes a condition or a degree of degradation of immortality. Seventh circle. People just 
swim in blood. This is the circle of the violence against oneself, which is suicide. And a surrounding scene is these dust balls of fire are falling on these souls. Dante and Virgil climb onto Gerion's back, eighth circle, the fraudulent. This circle is divided into ten chasms of stone, with bridges spanning the chasm. And you have the panders, which walk the other way. And all of those are basically struck with large whips by demons with huge horns. Eighth circle, chasm six. Here reside the hypocrites. Among these sinners, we can find Caiaphas and his uncle Annas crucified on the ground. Eighth circle, chasm 10, the falsifiers. As Virgil and Dante approach the 10th ditch of the eighth circle in the inferno, they hear the wails and smell the stench of the falsifiers. This circle is guarded by classical and biblical giants. Dante is approaching the ninth level of hell. He sees these towers. And these towers turn out to be giants, of which he ascribes Nimrod to be one of them. Ninth circle. Here reside the traitors. They're lying completely embanked in ice, twisted, distorted in every possible position. Lucifer, a three-headed creature, embedded in the ice. One head is staring straight ahead, the other heads are turned around. At this moment, Dante doesn't know whether he's alive or dead. He's terrified. What a nightmare. Of all Dante's works, the Inferno has, of course, provided the most powerful inspiration for hundreds and thousands of later artists in popular culture. Here, for instance, is the Delacroix painting, Dante and Virgil crossing the river Styx. But after the torment suffered by the damned in hell, Virgil and Dante escape from the inferno and move to purgatory. Notice we've got at the bottom this inverted cone of inferno that we've just passed through, all those circles, and then they go with a bridge to the other end. What you must understand is that when, the, um, when Satan hit the earth, and made the, the hole there, at the other side of the earth, a mountain came out. So you can see Dante knew um, that the earth was round. And Mount Purgatory is where they now uh, arrive at, antipodal to, to hell. And here you've got a painting of it, a drawing, of what the Mount Purgatory would look like. So they've arrived from the bottom and they're going to go up to the top, um, moving from hell to Purgatory and then to heaven. But now let's have a look at Purgatory first. Here they begin the process of spiritual rehabilitation. It's, it's a bridge that they've got to go along and they meet penitent pilgrims along the road of life. Uh, in hell, you've got the damned. In purgatory, you've got the penitent sinners who are learning. They must learn to reject the deceptive promises of the temporal world, and Dante must learn the same lesson. Uh, what you must understand, we've got um, uh, a combination of all his background here, the historical, political, and moral vistas that he explores, there's the classical influence, which gives his moral and political understanding, and then his native tradition, the philosophy of love, which is, is Christian. Now, in purgatory, we again have seven, but these are now seven, seven terraces that run round the mountain, seven, seven levels that represent the seven deadly sins. And what you must understand that the punishments here are to teach penitent sinners the opposite virtue. So it's not just a punishment, it is a lesson to acquire a version, uh, a virtue. And every sin has an opposite 
virtue. So for pride, it is humility. For envy, it is fraternal love. For wrath, it is gentleness and patience. For sloth, it is zeal. Avarice, they've got to become accustomed to poverty and learn to be generous. Gluttony, acquire the virtues of temperance and moderation. Lust, they've got to learn chastity. Now the last part of the journey begins at the top of Mount Purgatory when the penitents have acquired the virtues they can then move into heaven into paradise and it is at the top of mount purgatory and that dante calls the earthly paradise the garden of eden so that is the introduction to heaven beatrice leads dante through a series of concentric spheres surrounding the earth uh, and the journey through paradise is the soul's ascent to God. So we've come through the inferno with the bridge to purgatory, climbed the mountain, and now we ascend into paradise. And here you've got another lake painting, Beatrice leading Dante into paradise. another bit of poetry to us here is the start of it it's dante explaining what the intention of this final part of the work is thank you trudy la gloria di colui che tutto muove per l'universo penetra e risplende in una parte più e meno altrove Nel ciel che più della sua luce prende fu io e vidi cose che ridire né sa né può chi di la su discende. Perché la pressando se al suo desire nostro intelletto si profondo tanto che dietro la memoria non può ire. Veramente quando io del regno santo Nella mia mente potei far tesoro, sarà ora materia del mio canto. Thank you, Trudy. That was lovely. Now here we've got a diagram of the medieval cosmos. This is what heaven looks like. Dante may have known that the earth was round, but neither he nor any of his contemporaries knew that it was the sun and not the earth that sits at the center of our universe. The medieval cosmos was geocentered, with the sun merely one of the nine spheres that orbited around the earth, as you can see in this diagram. After the first seven spheres, we have the circle of the fixed stars and the outermost circle, which is the primum mobile, the prime mover nine spheres in all the first eight spheres all move from west to east and then the whole thing is moved from east to west by the prima mobile by the way each sphere sings its own unique note as it moves on its orbit round the earth creating the music of the spheres divinely beautiful music that only god can hear Starting at the centre, in the earthly paradise, Garden of Eden, from the summit of Mount Purgatory on earth, Beatrice, who has taken over from Virgil as Dante's guide, leads him through the nine spheres in paradise. In paradise, Dante meets redeemed souls who have passed through purgatory into heaven by acquiring the virtues that were required to defeat the sins. Beatrice leads him to each sphere in turn, and we meet interesting characters from history and his own life 
who symbolize various triumphs and virtues. The first fear is the sphere of the moon, the inconstant. And one of the characters he meets there is someone who has had to learn constancy. The sin, you see, would have been inconstancy. Constancy has been learned. And this is someone he knew, a nun who left to go and get married and then repented. Mercury, the ambitious. Justinian is the one who has learned to overcome he, uh, ambition. He says, uh, I was Caesar, I am now Justinian. Venus, the lovers, various lovers that have had to learn hard lessons. Charles Bottel is one that he mentions. You've got the sun, the wise, and the characters we meet include Thomas Aquinas and King Solomon. The warriors, Mars, the Charlemagne is one he meets there. Jupiter, the just rulers, David and Constantine are examples. Saturn, the contemplatives, he meets in Benedict there and has a very interesting philosophical discussion with him. He learns from all of these the lessons that they've learned. He has lovely conversations. Then we come to the realm of the fixed stars. The circle of the fixed stars represents the church triumphant. Here Dante is questioned by St. Peter to certify his faith. Then by St. James on his experience and dependence on hope. And finally by St. John on, the, on his understanding of love. So you've got faith, hope, love, the key tenets of the church triumphant. Beatrice now directs his attention to the Empyrean, the mind of God. And there you see Beatrice and Dante at the bottom. This is how he describes what his experience is going to be. O oh, grace abounding and allowing me to dare to fix my gaze on the eternal light, so deep my vision was consumed in it. I saw how it contains within its depths all things bound in a single book by love, of which creation is the scattered leaves, how substance, accident, and their relation were fused in such a way that what I now describe is but a glimmer of that light. Does he see God or think that he has fathomed the mind of God? Of course not. But having taken us on a journey that has explored in graphic, horrific detail the origins of evil and what it is to be human, he ends by suggesting a possibility of redemption, goodness, and sanctity. And love is not, so bad, not such a bad idea, especially in our own tortured, chaotic times. Dante died in 1320, a few months after finishing the Commedia, which he had started working on in 1307. He had not seen his beloved Florence for 20 years, and is buried in Ravenna. This is Dante's tomb, but it is not in the spot where he was originally buried. He was buried in 1320 in an ancient Roman sarcophagus next to the cloisters of this church in Ravenna. Subsequently, the church was renamed the Basilica of San Francisco. The sarcophagus was moved to this neoclassical tomb a few meters away from its original site in 1781. We cannot even be sure that the remains are still there, 
Succeeding generations of monks moved the body several times to hide it from various powers that wanted it over the centuries. The Florentines, Napoleon's army, Mussolini, Pope Leo X even wanted the body exhumed so that the bones could be burned at the stake as befits a heretic. But he is still here in Ravenna. And what is his legacy? He's a literary genius. He's responsible largely for the development of humanism. The challenge to hegemony of st church structures and the abuse of political power is very important. I wonder what he would have to say about our own battles with political corruption. He pioneered cultural and intellectual changes and was instrumental in the Middle Ages moving into the Renaissance. And very importantly, the use of the vernacular rather than Latin was the forerunner of what people like Chaucer and Boccaccio, for instance, were able to do. So he does have this very, very powerful legacy that we can share. And this is what T.S. Eliot has to say about him. Dante and Shakespeare divide the modern world between them. There is no third. What more can one say?